I'm Marco Marinucci. I'm a, a board member of the Zviek Foundation uh, and president of the Zviek Foundation. i um, going to tell you a little bit of a background of what you do um, and also then quickly introduce the speakers and the guests of uh, the evening. Um, Zviek Foundation, you're probably familiar with that. Uh, Zviek is uh, an entity, a, a project that has been around for a good 15 years started by our beloved uh, Jeff Capaccio, always in our heart. Um, and, uh, and after a number of years, uh, taking and supported by now a group of volunteers here, we have a, a few board members. Please raise your hand, board members. There's Giacomo, there's Massimo. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, at SVIAC Foundation, we support in Italian and Italian Americans uh, in Silicon Valley, in particular with the educational programs and also in their support of their professional development. Uh, speaking of which, of uh, professional development, uh, tonight uh, we do have a number of uh, uh, members of one of the uh, programs uh, that we also support in and has been around for quite some time. The program is called Fulbright Best. Here we have a so stand up, you guys, a Fulbright Best. Uh, welcome to them. They're here for six months. For the ones of you that are not familiar with Fulbright Best, it's a program that actually started, um, I lost count, I think 2008, 2009, by Ambassador Spoli at the time. Uh, the focus is to provide um, a number of uh, high caliber researchers that uh, want to be entrepreneurs and uh, uh, potential um, you know, players in the world in these days of innovation with a six months internship. And that's where they just started, literally this week. Uh, so please take some time to uh, exchange business cards and to welcome them into the tight community, Italian community in Silicon Valley. So that's uh, definitely one of the clear and uh, simple uh, programs that uh, we support. So welcome here. Um, uh, let's see, actually, uh, speaking of which, uh, each of them is doing a different uh, internship in the venture world. Uh, one of them, uh, Anita De Rosa, stand up please, Anita, I don't see, ah, right there. <laughs> so, uh, Anita is actually interning with Zviek Foundation, so she's uh, one of the hosts here. So, again, take time to uh, exchange ideas, suggestions, connections with these folks, because that's what uh, this community is all about. Um, actually, as, and uh, Anita has been, uh, has been an internship, but she runs a company that does internship. So it feels like a, re a re recursive uh, situation here. But uh, again, each of them is very interesting background, very different. So again, uh, spend some time to get to know them. All right. Uh, the other thing that we do as a, as a Zviek Foundation, we also host uh, events like this. This is kind of the bread and butter just to maintain the community alive. Uh, tonight we have the pleasure um, to have uh, uh, a guest speakers and a, and a friend that will moderate our guest speakers. You see, you see here the topic. Uh, the guest, our guest of the night is Ash Fontana. Right here, uh, Ash was born in Australia but with very strong uh, Italian roots and he decided to live in Bassano del Grappa of all places. Don't ask me, <laughs> don't ask me why. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, after a few grappas you probably uh, you know, learn why. Uh, but I had, the, I had the pleasure of knowing actually Ash for, for a good uh, decade, actually pretty, uh, probably a little bit more. Uh, let's see if I can embarrass you a little bit, but uh, uh, no, probably it's not, not quite now. But no, Ash has been a prolific VC venture capital. Um, and uh, and uh, lastly, also one of the managing partners of uh, probably the first uh, AI focused uh, VC in the Valley, it's called Zera Ventures, almost with the $400 million under management. Uh, when, the last time actually, one of the times I invited Ash as one of the speakers in some event we hosted, was the day that he was launching the Syndicate uh, a platform at, at AngelList. How many of you are familiar with AngelList? AngelList is probably the one disruptor of investment uh, uh, in you know platform in the world, and now the syndicate is managing probably several billion of dollars in t almost ten billion. So this is actually a, a you know a real a real uh, figure, um, and that's the time I when we cross path uh, and uh, what's that? When it, was zero. when it was zero, exactly the day that you were launching. I remember with a T-shirt, you know, in your in somewhere, and we were at a. Corriere della Sera tried to get you connected. 
the topic of an evening, though, uh, is AI. In particular, as you can see here, uh, how to draw a plan to implement and use AI to improve your uh, competitiveness, no matter which kind of industry you're in and whether or not you are, you are an expert. Um, uh, how to do that? Actually, just read his book. And that's, uh, it's funny because that was, oh, the book is just, uh, that's a typical, can you just click on uh, so that we can see the, the title of the book? The books are right there. I mean, a few of the smart young Italian guys already got, got a copy. <laughs> Uh, for the others, you are more than happy to go grab one, and uh, I think Ash is more than happy to write on it. Um, but really, the idea, and again, that's been actually my, my professional experience, is that uh, I spend uh, the summer, I mean, the summer, the Christmas vacation reading the book. Yeah, it was a tough, tough time for me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the result of it is I'd actually turn our uh, business of Mind the Bridge, that uh, for the ones of you that know, um, it's been always kind of a, uh, a, a business of, uh, of relationship and uh, an integration between startups and corporates into an AI platform first. Uh, and so again, that was, I think, the stimulated by reading, you know, the to-dos uh, and what is possible, what is not. And so I think there's going to be an opportunity for most of you, regardless of the uh, industry where you're in, to take some of the inputs that are uh, coming from a from a um, Ash book that is actually published by Penguin and uh, Random House. I will also have uh, Massimo Regoni, CEO B, long friends of ours and, uh, and fellow board members uh, of uh, uh, of the Zviak Foundation. So please welcome them to this conversation over the next forty minutes. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. So, I think they asked me to uh, host this chat because I'm not a technician. Um, I'm not an AI guru. Um, I'm like many of you, I run a company. And so, the fact that AI helps uh, drive uh, a car drive itself, awesome, but it does nothing for my company. And so the, the question that Ash um, tried to answer you know, so, so well with his book, I think is the question for entrepreneurs and people that, that run businesses or managers, et cetera. How do I actually leverage AI right, to, to compete and, and, and hopefully win at, at what I do? So we're going to have a discussion about that and, and try to make it really practical and uh, down to earth. And so we're exchanging a couple messages. And um, so let, let's start with a very, very um, practical example that's near to where we are today. So let's say you, you run a restaurant like Donato does. And um, sometimes you run out of fish on Sundays. And you run one restaurant. Um, Donato knows. He knows. He doesn't need AI. He knows why he ran out of fish maybe one time. And he normally, I'm sure if he were here tonight, he would probably tell us, I never run out of fish. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, but, what if, but what if Donato raises a bunch of money, because uh, he does so well, and now they open 50 restaurants around the country in different locations with different demographics, with different climates. And sometimes they do run out of fish on Sundays. And now, as a single person, you probably don't have that answer. And so that's maybe where we start, because you, you'd say it so well, Ash, in, in, your, in your book. You start with one question, one set of stakeholders, and one data set, like, we ran out of fish on Sundays. Some people ordered, and it wasn't there. So talk to us about um, how do we start. Yeah, so thank you very much for that introduction. I think you've really captured what I tried to write about, um, which is a more pragmatic way to think about AI and a way to think about AI that is not philosophical, it's not super far future, what might happen in 50 to 100 years, and it's not a, a programming book. Um, it's somewhere in between. So there was a really good introduction, and it was good to bring it down to this example. Um, one, because I have invested in a company that solves this exact problem, which is not to say I'm going to talk about that company at all. Don't worry about that. 
it's to say that I've spent many years thinking about you know, the Donato problem, as we're going to call it here tonight. Um, and what you're referring to there, the idea of starting with one question to, to answer, one data set, one modeling technique, one person, and running it on one computer, not running it on a whole bunch of computers in a distributed way with, you know, and this is a little bit poetic, but it often works out to be the case for $1,000. Um, that's what I, where I start the book, which is this notion of lean AI, which is clearly borrowing off the lean startup thing, but taking it to um, a different domain. You know, lean startup, of course, being about how do I get out my minimum viable product? And I talk about how do you get out, you know, your first model that gives you a clue into what might be possible in terms of leveraging AI in your business. Um, and so in this example, you know, if you just have the data set of like, these are the days we ran out of fish, then the question is, well, how do we get one more data set that might provide some degree of correlation um, with that data set and we can, we can find a pattern? So that could be, you know, something like um, online versus in-person orders or it could be something like um, what menu item was it on? Was it on a menu item which is selling a whole fish or selling something like a stew or something like that? And often, this is a good example because often the problem, as I'm sure many people in this room have experienced or found with getting started with AI is that you sort of have half the data and you know where you can get the other half, but it's a pain to get. Um, and so, you know, you sort of have half the data, which is we know when we're going to run out, but what's a pain to get is how the menu changed over time um, or, you know, how much we have left every Thursday night because that requires someone going into the fridge and writing it down in an accurate way every Thursday night. And so <clears throat> that's really the problem and that's where, you know, the world of AI and software merge, which is how do you develop good software that it makes it very easy to capture the data you need and then build those first models and whatever else. So I'm not sure how much we want to go into this Donato example right now. I'm sure we'll go into it over the course of the conversation, but it's a good example because it really represents um, most people's starting point, which is they have an idea of something they can fix with AI. They have half the data, but the other half seems really intimidating and annoying. Um, and I try to break that down in the book by, for example, essentially dedicating half the book to how do you get more data um, and all the weird and wonderful ways to do that. I think there are like 26 ways I talk through broadly and then give examples and whatnot uh, throughout the book as well. Yeah, and I was just talking to Anita earlier about, in fact, I told you, you know, there's, there's a good chapter on that because she has that problem right now. Um, yeah, we'll go back to the data, but I wanted to go back to one thing that you, that you mentioned because, uh, you know, we're in Silicon Valley and there's a lot of people here that, that are very familiar with the concept of yeah. the lean startup and the minimum viable product. I thought you, 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 um, you know, there's many definitions of what it is, but you, you said it so well. It's, Ultimately, the minimum viable product is simply the time when your product becomes useful, right? Is, is this darn thing actually useful at something? That is the minimum viable product. And so then you applied that concept to a machine learning algorithm yeah. whose job is to predict something, like are we actually going to run out of fish? Um, and you said, okay, what you need to get to is a time when the algorithm becomes useful, right? You, you call the, the, the prediction usability threshold. Yeah. So maybe talk to us a little bit about um, how you get there and, and when do you know, you know, yeah. what, what are the signals to look at to know that you've gotten to a point where you, it's useful? Yeah, I think this is a really important thing which is why I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the metrics um, that can help you determine when it's going to be useful because otherwise this just ends up being like an endless R&D project uh, in a lot of organizations. And I think, so what I'm saying is it's really important up front to know when you think you're going to actually trust the prediction that comes out of the model. As in at what level of accuracy will you actually make a decision as a result of having that prediction? just sort of stepping back and also referencing a book that my friends wrote called Prediction Machines, you know, every decision is a combination of like getting input, processing the input, making a prediction about all the potential realities and then deciding to do something and then getting feedback on your decision and then trying to make a better decision next time. 
you know, that's what we're doing all the time. Whether it's reaching for a door handle, we're trying to figure out like, will the hand land on the handle? Um, or whether it's you know, deciding when we're gonna buy a house or who we're gonna partner with. We're constantly making predictions and decisions and trying to learn from them as humans. And you know, AI is essentially doing that um, for us in, in a more leveraged way in some cases. But the point is like, when are you gonna rely on it? As in like, when is the person who's responsible for ordering stuff at the restaurant actually gonna listen to the model, essentially, rather than just completely ignore it and make that whole development process a complete waste of time? And so that's what the, the put is, the prediction usability threshold. It's the degree, it's the level of accuracy at which you start trusting it. And so for example, in domains like medicine, that's very, very high. It's usually 100%. You're not gonna trust a model that says, this person is likely to have a stroke in the next 20 minutes, therefore take them straight to surgery, unless it's really quite accurate because a neurosurgeon's time is valuable, the cost of getting them ready for that surgery, the stress on their family, knowing that's gonna happen, blah, blah, blah. Or like, you know, I've worked with lots of companies looking at septi sepsis and septic shock. Um, <clears throat> anyway, a lot of applications in the medical domain and the prediction usability threshold is super high. But for other applications of AI, like figuring out how to segment your marketing database and run a whole bunch of alternative campaigns, the prediction usability threshold is very low because the cost of getting it wrong is you know, a couple of unsubscribes um, to your email list. Um, and so it, it varies quite a lot between domains, it varies quite a lot across applications, and it, <laughs> it's not something that I've seen a lot of people at big companies actually ask when they start these projects. You know, I talk to and consult with the CIOs and CDOs of some of the biggest banks and governments and whatever else in the world. And it's absolutely amazing to see them about to embark on like a really expensive AI project and not actually ask this question. Like, when are we gonna trust it? When is it gonna be accurate enough for us to trust it? And can we get there? Like, do we have enough data to train this model up to that level of accuracy? or? is the initial experiment we did any, getting anywhere near that level of accuracy? And what's, what's the tractable path to getting there? Incidentally, this is also really useful as an investor to think about this because you know, if you're looking at a startup and they say, we can identify every time they're, um, you know, we're out of pasta on the shelves at, at Drager's, um, which is a startup I actually invested in, so it's a very uh, relevant e example, one I know well. And, and you look at their models and they can get it right about 70% of the time. Then you go and talk to you know, the person that runs Dragers and said, yeah, I'll trust it when it's like right 90% of the time. Then I have to go back as an investor and figure out, well, how much is it gonna cost to improve the model to get it from 70 to 90%? Are we gonna have to pay a lot of people to label a lot of data, like write on a, a picture that there is or is not pasta? Are we gonna have to go and buy a product database, like a database of images that has lots of different pictures of lots of different packets of pasta at lots of different angles and lots of different light. Are we gonna have to do that? As an investor, this is very useful to think about as well because you know, look, everyone's a capital allocator, whether you're a manager at a company or an investor or whatever else, or an individual running a project. And to think, what is our actual goal and is, it, is there a tractable path to get there um, requires like having a metric that you can put around that goal. And there are just very few metrics in the world uh, of AI today. So, Again, that's why I have a whole chapter in it, and that's why it sort of starts with this really basic one, which is when is it going to be usable and trustable? Um, let's say that the, uh, we're, we're, we're the board of directors of this company that now has hundreds of restaurants around the, company, around the country, and they're, they're still running out of fish sometimes on Sundays, um, and we just cannot figure out why. Um, what kind of data what are we missing? Like, what kind of data would you look for next? Anybody? Weather. Weather? Yeah. Any, anybody else? Sports events? Sports events. Mm -hmm. Right, number of orders, uh, like, over time. <laughs> it's like supply, supply issues. Um, okay, great, thanks. Uh, so, the, the, the point is that, um, as you say in the book, you know, there's the bottom line is get as much data 
as you can. Data obviously it makes sense, right? And and it's there's no there's no right answer. Like it depends on uh, the the right time, the you know the right circumstance. Um, and you need to be creative with like where are you gonna get some da data, like weather. Probably an easy one, right? Uh, to get the, there's probably APIs, etc. That um, so talk to us a little bit about you know w w when you when you go into the details of about okay where is the data where can I find it uh, give us a little bit of uh, you know how that works yeah this is a really good question uh, because at the moment you know we've just seen an explosion in complexity um, around how people get calories basically because in a sense it's really simple now to get calories you can push a button and calories arrive at your door 20 minutes later for 20 bucks. Um, but in a sense, it's a lot more complex because like food supply chains are all over the place because the options you have and how you think about those options in a delivery app is um, sometimes not presented very well to you. There are so many delivery apps. There are so many different ways to prepare and deliver food to someone now. It just doesn't, doesn't just come from a restaurant or a supermarket. It comes from a restaurant or supermarket or a ghost kitchen, like a kitchen that serves five different cuisines at once. And so the point is, this has become a lot more complex uh, recently, but there's also a lot of opportunity in that. And you know, as someone who grew up in an Italian household, it kills me that people get food delivered to their house. That it's just like being turned upside down and cold and it's disgusting. But <laughs> this is the way the world's going because you know, as human beings, we've evolved to get calories as easily as we possibly can. Take yeah. I basically tell them that the, the takeout should not exist. And they're yes. like, Dad, oh, what, are you, oh what, my gosh. what are you talking about? This is a huge rant. I mean, by the time you click on, a, on an app and look at the driver and then look up and go back to your phone and then blah, 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 and then pay all this money and there's full of sugar and whatever, make a plate of pasta. <laughs> <laughs> Just boil some water. Anyway, um, the point to your question, whatever, it's happening. People like the ease of all this stuff. Um, and in a sense, it's a, it's a good thing that people who want to be creative with food have many ways to, to, um, to d express that and deliver it to people and whatever else. It's a good thing that a lot of people in a pinch can get food in a certain way. Anyway, back to the question and away from my rant about like just <laughs> learn how to make pesto and pasta. Um, there is a lot of really interesting data out there now from the delivery platforms because they are able to present multiple cuisines, multiple menu items on any given day to lots of different customer segments. And you can take that um, from them, you know, even individual vendors who, you know, so a ghost kitchen that has like a Mexican menu or a Japanese menu or whatever, can like recombine and repopulate their menu every day, sometimes multiple times per day, and see what people order, see what's popular when, what's popular on a Sunday afternoon, what's popular on a Wednesday night, what's popular at certain price points, what, what sells at certain price points, et cetera. And so you can run all these experiments so easily now and get all that data, not all of it all the time, but get a lot of that data back from the delivery platforms and make decisions about, okay, how do I take this pile of food that I've ordered, I've ordered you know, 10 kilos of Brussels sprouts and five kilos of steak and 10 kilos of fish and whatever, and combine it into a recipe and then turn a recipe into a menu and then populate that. And that's like quite a, that's a thing that like a lot of chefs do at the start of their day. And it's a thing that a lot of people do with spreadsheets and whatnot. But now you can start, if you have like a good recipe database, now you can start dynamically generating menus all the time. Um, so, you know, on a given day, you put on like more nachos on a Sunday and then you recombine those same nacho ingredients to do like a family taco meal on a Monday. Um, and so you can learn how to do things like that if you have the data coming from the delivery system, if you have good storeroom data, and then if you have some other ancillary data sets. Um, so I'm not sure if that sort of gets to your question, but the point is there's more data now than ever. We can more dynamically satisfy people's preferences if we use the right systems. And I'm going to refrain from plugging certain companies that I've invested in. Well, and, you, and what, basically what you're saying is also just be creative, right? In that case, maybe not a lot of your business might come from those delivery apps, yeah. but those delivery apps give you data yeah. 
that you can then leverage. And so, you know, sometimes you do experiments in your business just because you get data from those experiments. Maybe they're not going to fundamentally change the way you run your business, yeah. but running experiments, you know. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. And I think um, a lot of people don't leverage the delivery option um, in that way. Like a lot of people running restaurants, that is, as in they tend to either go all in or not with a delivery app. They're like, I'm going to let my food be delivered through this app and arrive cold and upside down and whatever, and they take 30%. Or I'm just not going to do that. But actually, maybe a smarter approach would be, I'm just going to do this for a week, a month, and test it out and see what sells and whatnot, and then use that to figure out what to put on my menu. Because again, in the past, you know, you only printed a new menu every season or whatever else. Um, or you only, um, you only redid your recipes when you got time away from your business to actually think through this and be creative. Um, but now you can do it every single day with like very little effort by just sort of quickly recombining a few menu items um, or letting an AI suggest it to you and figure it out. All right, so we're still the board of directors of this restaurant business. So we've now gotten to 200 restaurants. We're doing really well. But there's still some restaurants that run out on Sunday and they still run out of fish and we're like, I can't understand. And so we actually start monitoring things and we notice sometimes that there's people celebrating graduations. And we go, damn it, I, we, we didn't think about that. Like when there's, you know, maybe the school calendar can be a data set that, that helps the, the model. And so, silly example to go into one of the concepts of Mm -hmm. machine learning that you hear about all the time, but um, I want you to explain it to us, the concept of training the model. Okay, so I, I, I think I understood that there's one piece of information, in this case, the school calendar, and I want to, and I want to train the model so that it takes this into account. What does it actually mean to train a model? Yeah, I think there are two things here. Um, one is a direct answer to that question, and two is a broader conversation about product design and product management in an AI-first company. Um, I mean, a lot of people in the room are probably very familiar with AI, so I'm sorry if this is a little bit elementary, um, but I think it will help bring everyone up to the same level. But to train a model means to try to make the statistical representation of reality as close to reality as possible. It means to try and let the model see enough examples of what it's probably going to see um, such that it can take any given bit of data and make a prediction of reality that gets close, that's, that's, that's pretty close to what eventuates. Um, you know, very practically it means, you know, taking something off the shelf or building a model or whatever else, feeding a bunch of data in it, seeing what the predictions are and then matching it back to some actual data that you have from the real world um, that you held out. So you feed some of the data into the training set and you hold out a little bit of it and then compare it later on and see how close they are. So that's what it means. Now, this graduation example is um, interesting because I think it brings up uh, the question of product design, which is how do you design these products that are sort of powered by AI, these AI-first products, in such a way where you can capture that information from the people working at the 174th restaurant you opened in Fresno. Like the person manager, how do you get feedback from that manager such that it trains the model for everyone? And this is the notion of feedback data, which is, you know, if it's telling that manager, manager to order 10 kilos on a Sunday and they end up needing 30, um, how do you capture from them that I ended up needing 30? Um, and you've got to sort of present the prediction in a way where they can correct it. And then you've got to capture that 30, that number 30, and then figure out whether that goes into the next training round of the model. And this is where it's really important, I think, in an AI-first company to work with designers and product managers and whatnot that understand that, that understand that they're designing a product not just to be used in that like a product that, that that will be engaged with by the manager but that will actually capture feedback data from the manager and I I go th through in the book a whole chapter called AI first teams 
about how all the roles in an AI first company are a little bit different from the roles in a, any given software company. How product management's a little bit different. Infrastructure engineering is a little bit different. Engineering management is a bit different. And what's, what you need to do to enable those people, what skills they need to have, what tools you need to provide them with, how much you need to pay them, all that sort of stuff. And um, try to go through that in the book as well. By the way, I love that the way that our vector into talking about AI is food. Um, it's pretty predictable, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and, and the beautiful thing that's happening right now is that there's tools that make it such that one of my developers, for example, came to me and um, basically he was saying, look, Massimo, even you can get this. Like, <laughs> and, and this was, uh, this is actually a product that, um, so we, we run um, um, a machine learning model on SageMaker on AWS. And uh, so AWS, Amazon Web Services came out with a product called Canvas that's literally basically a spreadsheet where you feed the data and the spreadsheet basically tells you which of the columns contain um, interesting data. And so you build the model and, and so again, I'm not a technician, I'm not a, but if I can see, you know, if the, if the system is telling me, hey Massimo, you know, there's this stuff in that, in that column that, that's particularly interesting. Then, then you can go back and say, okay, I probably need more of that piece of data, right? Uh, and this is just to say for some of you that are just getting into this, there are tools today like, like this Canvas within the AWS SageMaker platform that make it like, almost like you're, you're working in, in Google Sheet or in, in Excel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, you probably have other examples of that. So many, it's absolutely unreal what is out there right now to leverage. Firstly, I will say that a lot of what a lot of people do in Excel is building a machine learning model. Um, they're just doing it slowly and manually, um, and which is totally, which is totally fine a lot of the time. Like it's, it's absolutely does the job. I've done, I've built plenty of models like that, and they did the job. Um, but there are tools like what you can find in SageMaker. So there's like the the really the really easy to use tools that have an interface that you're familiar with, like a spreadsheet. You know. Spreadsheet of data in, spreadsheet of predictions out. That's basically how that thing works. Um, it's, it's unreal. Anyone that can use a spreadsheet really can use this tool, Canvas. There's also um, other interfaces. So there are now ways to just program an AI model with a visual programming language, as in, I want this, this is my data input, as like a circle, and it leads to that, leads to that, leads to that, and I want it to spit this out in this interface, sort of like, um, like Zapier or one of these like workflow stitching tools. Um, there are those for AI now too. Uh, and then they go away and build the model for you. It goes away and builds the model for you. But also they're just all these pre-trained models, right? Like these image recognition or language understanding models that are trained on so much data that essentially anything you feed it will be pretty accurate. Um, I, I should rephrase that. Essentially, anything you want it to do, it will be able to do with quite a high degree of accuracy. So, for example, the pasta thing I, I, I gave it before, like you can give it a thousand images uh, of, uh, of a shelf and just ask it recognize pasta boxes, and it will get it pretty good most of the time. Not good enough that Walmart's going to buy your product, but you know, good enough um, for some use cases, like in a convenience store, for example. Um, I mean, maybe this is a good example. I looked at a company many, many years ago in, in AI terms, so like seven years ago in real world terms, um, that was trying to predict when sandwiches went out of stock at convenience stores. And the current degree of accuracy of that is super low. Like most people get that wrong at least half the time, as in half the sandwiches left on the shelf at the end of the day. And this company had a model that could get it to like 70%. Um, as in you'd probably have like less than 30% wastage or something like that. Now, you could probably build that model with a pre-trained Google model at 70% or something like that. And they had to do all this work to do it themselves. So there's all of that. Anyway, there are so many tools out there to use. Um, it is absolutely amazing. And I do want to emphasize this, like people that do not have a machine learning background can go really far. And not just completely non-technical people, but also people that have a background in statistics because they studied you know, geostatistics or meteorology or 
biostatistics or something like that, or people that just are good at maths or whatever else can get up to speed so quickly um, because you know a lot of these machine learning models are just like a bunch of probability functions, um, and they can get up to speed so quickly and be you know what you would call a bona fide machine learning engineer very quickly, like in six months. And this is a hiring advantage that you know I've exploited many, many times, which is go into physics faculties, people working on plasma physics problems, or go into you know um, a, again like bio faculties or whatnot and pull these people out, run them through a course, and place them in companies. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of managers should think about a lot more, rather than trying to hire the same people that have the same machine learning specialization in computer science at Carnegie Mellon, because um, they're really hard to hire. Awesome. Uh, let's open it up to the audience. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've got some questions. So Marco, do we have another mic? Or otherwise, I'll, I'll just go around. We can yeah. hear. Hi, um, I hear about the metrics to evaluate the accuracy about a prediction, and uh, that uh, that is uh, um, uh, there are a lot of metrics uh, very useful accuracy, my and etc. But uh, I want to know how to understand uh, the correlation between the number of uh, test samples the number of training samples, the distribution of the targets, yeah. and the accuracy. Because uh, I, can, uh, uh, I can make a 99% accuracy using uh, 100 of data, and then I, uh, I have uh, a 50% uh, accuracy when I use uh, 1,000 of data. Yeah. So I want to understand the correlation between these uh, metrics. Yeah, so that's... Um I think that brings up an important broader point, which is there are diminishing returns to scale of data, um, to borrow sort of a concept from economics that most people will be really familiar with. Um, as in, you know, it's not always the case that more data is going to make it a lot better. It's not always the case that incremental investments in data or in, you know, coming up with a new modeling technique or whatever else will make it better. And I think it's really important for people to measure exactly what you're talking about there. Now, um, you said, I want to know, uh, there's obviously a lot more detail behind all of this. And I try to generalize to give people a starting point in the book. Um, the reality is what I do day to day uh, involves far more detailed and specific work uh, around figuring out what the metric should be for any given project, any given R&D project at a company into a new modeling technique or any given um, consulting project for a customer that has some, some business goal and we've got to figure out how to build technology to reach that goal. So the reality is, of course, the metrics are more specialized and more, um, yeah, more specific to the problems that we're solving any given time. Uh, but you know, what's in the book is a starting point and also principles like the one that you mentioned is in there, as in you, know, you, you really do need to be aware of the cost. So there's a a chapter, a, a sub-chapter at the end called Measuring the Models, which is basically like uh, about accounting uh, for these, uh, for these, in these companies, in these AI-first companies. So what do you include in the cost of goods sold if you're paying for a lot of data for, that's only relevant to a particular customer? Like, does that affect your unit gross margin or your company gross margin? And like, how do you think about how to, um, be honest about accounting for these costs as well. So anyway, um, the point is, I can't answer your question without a very specific example. I can't get to what I think you really want to know, but there's a starting point in there. So I really like what you said about data and being able to make decisions on the data, but isn't it really difficult to get that data in to the right people yeah. in a timely <clears throat> manner? And so can you talk a little bit about those issues about you know, time to data, to mm -hmm. time to decisions, to yeah. time to... Yeah, and this is where a lot of this becomes a people problem, not a technology problem. A lot of this becomes a data infrastructure and computing infrastructure problem, um, not, a, not an AI problem. Uh, and this is, I think, where a lot of it becomes a, um, a design problem, as I said before, or product management problem, rather than a machine learning research problem. 
Um, so yeah, look, I spend a lot of time with very, very large companies and even small companies that, that fall over um, because of a lot of the problems you mentioned. Um, so that's why in the book I talk a lot about those things. So I go through, uh, there's a, a whole chapter about um, essentially making it work, like best practices for implementation. So how do you make sure people know how to interact with it? How do you run training programs? How do you get the right people involved so you don't get political barriers in a, to adoption? How do you manage the trade-off between getting your data infrastructure perfect and getting it good enough? Um, I mean, I'll just go into that one particular thing. You know, I think a pitfall for so many organizations I work with is they don't want to start the AI project until their data project, their database project is done. But what they're forgetting is all a database is, is it's is a, your represent, a representation of reality in a database. It's not reality, the reality is always changing and it's just a database and database, you know, the, the schema of it, the structure of it, what you store, how you store it, it's just gonna be changing all the time. So there's no like platonic ideal of a database for a given company, unless that company operates in some world I don't live in which never changes. Um, so I think this is a pitfall for a lot of people rather than a challenge, is in they try to get that perfect and they try to do their five year, $50 million Oracle project before even starting with AI. And I think that's a problem because you can do so much with small crappy data sets and very unskilled people. Like that's a message I wanna get across. Like you don't need perfect data and a million dollars and a bunch of PhDs to get started with AI. You can start up with small crappy data sets with really unskilled people. And you can get like a pretty decent prediction. Like this fish prediction, right? Like let's just say you're running a chain of 200 restaurants. Good luck to you, that sounds like a terrible job. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really tough job. And all you really need to do though, in a given year to get your margin from nine to 13% is sell higher priced seafood items on a Sunday. Um, then you know you can actually, I don't know, I'm just doing the numbers in my head. You could actually figure that out with reasonable certainty such that you could make decisions and make more money and get your margin up like that without spending much money at all, like a couple of thousand dollars. Um, and if you think about a massive restaurant that'll do 100 grand in a night, like a really big, good restaurant, or even any smaller restaurant doing tens of thousands of dollars a night, and if you think about a margin accretion on some of those items of a couple of percent, blah, 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 you can all do the numbers. Like, you're all smart because you're Italian. Um, and there's good mathematics education in Italy, which, by the way, is amazing. Um, it is unbelievable how much talent there is in Italy, but this is a separate conversation. I'm just, prompt, I'm just prompting a question um, that someone might, or a topic someone might want to talk about here or afterwards. But you can do the numbers. It's, it, you spend a couple of grand on building a model like that, like the one we've been sort of talking, the example we've been using the whole way through, and you can make a lot of money, and people don't realize this. And that's what I tried to write about. Because again, AI in the media is a whole bunch of incredibly expensive stuff that doesn't work, like self-driving cars. We have about 300, 300 people, and, and we do all development in Italy. So yeah, there's incredible engineers. Um, so yeah, we, that's 100% uh, correct. Um, you know, th one of the reasons why we use this uh, restaurant idea is also that you make a really interesting point um, at some point uh, that you say it's so important to understand the problem that actually when you're looking at the investment sometimes it's better to invest on a service business like buy out a service business yeah. instead of a technology business mm -hmm. like invest in the technology later mm -hmm. because the technology is yeah. some of it is so available like go out and, and buy something that gets you so close to what the actual problem is and I thought that, that was super interesting because we forget about that here, especially Silicon Valley, all, all the time, right? You go technology first, and then you're like, well, did you actually, do you really know <laughs> what the real problem, right, is? Yeah, and so I was um, the biggest investor in this company called Kaggle, which is the biggest machine learning community in the world. Um, Google bought it a while ago. And Kaggle has millions of data scientists and machine learning engineers on there competing to build the best predictive models for certain data sets all day long. 
And so, for example, um, famous Kaggle competitions include an essay grading competition that the Gates Foundation put up. So they put up a bunch of, they put up a data set of a bunch of essays and they said, make a model that can automatically grade these essays A, B, C, or D, um, like high, high school uh, entrance exam essays and stuff like that. Or uh, there was a dark matter competition on Kaggle, which is NASA put up a data set saying like identify dark matter in all this in all this image in all this um, radio uh, these radio files that we have from our space telescopes. And someone who studied geology won that competition um, from memory. They had a diabetic retinopathy competition, which is here are a bunch of images of people's retinas, figure out which ones have diabetic retinopathy and which don't automatically. Um, and this really young lady working at a hedge fund in New York won that competition. Um, anyway, the point is it's an amazing platform with millions of data scientists and machine learning engineers on there, and I don't make any money out of pushing Kaggle anymore because it's owned by Google. But <coughs> hiring, finding someone on the Kaggle job board and paying them X hundred dollars per hour to sit with you, understand your problem, take a bunch of methods that they use every day, and applying it to your problem will get you so much further than buying X, you know, auto machine learning product, or in most cases, or buying um, something that your Microsoft rep is, is trying to sell you. Like, that will work so much more often, I think, in my experience, not always, of course, than, you know, the alternative. And this is, again, a message I want to get across, which, which you've summarized really well, you know, start with services. Like that's the title of a subchapter in the book. Start with services. Start with actually working with someone or if you're looking to use AI or start with actually sitting with customers if you're looking to sell something built on AI. Um, and again, it's, it's just such an obvious thing to say, but this is the stuff that needs to be said to help people take the step to actually leverage this technology. Any more questions? Thank you. So um, I take a look at the book, and uh, actually we are talking about how high artificial intelligence is going to serve humans mm -hmm. and uh, helping us to, let's say, improve and doing something more efficient. But my question is, uh, um, right now we are talking about data. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe this is uh, something for the future, but what do you think about uh, if this technology is going to, let's say, um, replicate some human skills, such as, I don't know, creativity, imagination, yeah. and how, uh, where we are now, and what you think is going to be in the future? Yeah. I don't think it will, and I think it's a waste of time to try and make it do that. Um, so what I mean by, or what I could say, I guess, to make sense of that is, there are many, I believe that there are many, many forms of intelligence. You can find a lot of them in animals. You can find some of them in humans, not many. You can find, <laughs> <laughs> you can find a lot of them in, um, in just like things that don't even represent conscious beings, like colonies of bacteria and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we can find forms of intelligence all over the place. And fundamentally, I define intelligence as the rate at which you learn, or the rate at which something learns. And so we can design systems that learn very specific things really quickly. Like babies are amazing at learning how to stand up really quickly. Um, robots that we design with certain modeling paradigms are not very good at that. They take a very, very long time to learn how to stand up. Um, but robots we design to identify if a bottle cap is too big for a given bottle are very good at that. They're way better at that than humans. They do it more reliably and more accurately. So the point is, I think what we should, uh, I shouldn't say the word, I, I don't like using the word should. I think what is a more productive avenue for us um, as people that build, invest in, work on technology, um, as in work on levers for humans, because that's what technology is, it's a lever for us, I think it's more productive to focus on building very specific forms of intelligence that do things we don't want to do or that aren't our form of intelligence. And put another way, I think trying to replicate, understand and replicate human intelligence is just like a completely intractable and unproductive problem to work on. 
Um, whereas trying to develop some new form of intelligence that does something useful for us is great. Um, so back to the self-driving cars thing, you know, trying to develop something that drives as well as a human with other humans on the road, is like, it's still relatively intractable. But trying to develop something that drives around a retirement community with you know, rails and gates and things like that and drives old people around that need to be driven around all day long because they can't walk that well anymore or whatever else serves us so much better and is such is a far more tractable problem than driving people who want to like sit on Twitter on the 101. Like that's a waste of time. That's not really serving anyone. It's not serving a part of portion of the community that needs to be served. Um, anyway, that's a rant. But it, it goes to the point of what specific forms of intelligence will serve us and how do we develop them um, in a very targeted way rather than trying to come up with some artificial general intelligence. Like that is just um, an intellectual black hole. I'm curious uh, about uh, how did you study the Donato's problem? Did you use uh, data provided by different restaurants or only by uh, Donato's restaurants? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and this goes to the notion of data network effects, uh, which I cover in the book. And so a lot of people have tried to use this, uh, a lot of people have tried to describe like how data gives you a competitive advantage. They're like, more data is better. There's a scale effect to data. That's not true most of the time. And they use things like data is the new oil and whatever. It's just like, especially in this case, exactly in the case of like a restaurant with 50 tables, more data, just like, even if it was better, that's not a useful thing to say because you only have so many tables and so much data. Anyway, a lot of people have tried to figure out how to articulate how data and machine learning gives you a competitive advantage and I think everyone's failed, um, and therefore we don't have good language around, around this. And that's why I wrote this book. That was the genesis of the book, and that is the notion of a data learning effect, which is the combination of a critical mass of data, could be a lot, could be a little, but it's enough data that you can then process, apply some capability to turn into information by labeling it properly or something like that, and then learn over automatically on a computational substrate, which is the network effect part of this. Anyway, this is all to say, in the book, I give a model and a way to measure how much you would benefit from having other data come in from third party sources and how you develop those network effects internally but also externally. So again, bringing it back to the example, how would you develop a way for Donato to get more data from its own customers but also, how would you maybe work with another coalition of restaurants to get more data about a certain thing? Like, what do people order on Sundays anywhere around here? Is it just like, do people just not go out on a certain day here or whatever? And you can't really tell that just by having the data from Donato, but you, have, you can tell that by having data from another coalition around here. So I talk about the notion of a data coalition as well. Um, anyway, it's all in there. Yeah. I think that the, the choice of the uh, dish uh, is uh, uh, so biased by yeah. the, uh, how the chef uh, prepared yeah. this dish. Exactly. So maybe I think that could be uh, possible to uh, study uh, using data yeah. about uh, other restaurants, yeah. maybe do a regression problem about how, how much people yeah. won't spend uh, the yeah. Sunday, for instance, exactly. or the Monday. But and what, what I would regress on is, uh, yeah. is the chef Sicilian, because if they are the fish, it's going to be great. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be really good. My non is Sicilian. Anybody else? Yeah. There's one back there. All right. Yeah. Okay. One Isn't yeah. too much a data sometimes a problem, though? I mean, you yeah. have... Um, you know, many different data. Sometimes you have the algorithm that focus on one instead of the other. Um, yeah. So, for instance, I look a lot. I watch a lot of soccer matches. 
in the soccer matches many times there is, uh, you know, a team that has 67% ball possession yeah. uh, or uh, 523 passes. It doesn't mean anything because no. the, if you pass the, the, you know, the ball from one to another in one yard. So how yeah. do you distinguish the important yeah. and <coughs> what feedback you have? Like, like in the example of the Donado, maybe the graduation ceremony has nothing to do with the fish. So how, after you try and say, no, so how do you feedback and yeah. machine learning can help on that? I don't know. I, li I like this. I think I'm going to call the uh, having too much data problem now the, the Spanish ping pong problem. Because you know that's how the Spanish play soccer; they just pass it a lot. Nothing really happens. Um, but anyway, the it is it is often the problem uh, for a lot of people, as in they have so much data they don't even know what question to ask anymore. And again, like I sound like I'm just a very simple human being, and I am. I'm not very smart. But the point I try to get across in the book over and over again is just ask the right question. Figure out what question you're even asking. Like, what do you actually need to know? Do you need to know um, why do I run out of fish on Sundays? Or do you need to know what dishes with fish in it do people want? Or, like, what is your question that's actually going to get to it? Or do you need to know, like, what are the highest margin menu items that sell the most? And, why don't I, and can I produce more of them given the stock I have in the fridge? Like, that's probably the best question to answer, or to ask, sorry, in that case. Um, so again, I, I sound very simple, but just getting to the bottom of the question um, will help you get around problems like having way too much data. So it's a bit simple, yeah. Okay, so you are an AI expert, but also a VC. Yeah. So how much data is a good amount of data? And also, if mm. I have a startup yeah. and I need to prove my concept, so mm. maybe I do an MVP, mm -hmm. but obviously mm. I don't have enough data <laughs> to actually mm. prove my algorithm. Mm. So how do I present a um, good MVP yeah. that is successful for a VC to invest on me? Yeah, so uh, it's a very good question. and. I think the real answer to your question is find someone who actually knows what they're doing. As in, a lot of, it, and it's true in lots of different domains, right? Like, if you're building a consumer app and you're approaching investors that have no experience with the, the consumers you're targeting, like you're building a beauty app and you're approaching investors that have never worked on beauty products or a food app, investors never worked in the food industry or whatever else, because they don't know anything about the domain, they're just gonna wait until there are numbers that prove that the market wants it. And anyway, that's just sort of an analogy. In AI, you know, a lot of investors that don't know very much about AI will want to see like very clear evidence that the prediction is useful, that it's driving revenue for the customer, et cetera, et cetera. But by the time you've got that, you've probably got a couple of million bucks in revenue because you found a customer that you can drive a lot of revenue for and you, you you're, uh, you're, you're taking a portion of that. You've just got to find investors that actually understand the fundamental technology, as in they can see that if you've fed this type of model, this convolutional neural network, this many images, and got to this degree of accuracy, that if you add this feature to the model with the same data set, you're probably going to get up another 2 or 3%. Or if you add more data for more edge cases, you're probably going to get um, and up another couple of percent or whatever else. The point is you, know, you need to approach people with technical expertise. Um, as in, I'm not going to answer your question by saying you need this much data, you need to get this level of accuracy or whatever else, because that's, the, that's um, disingenuous. Like, it's not going to work for you. What would work for you is just approaching an investor with technical expertise. But it's a good thing then to do an MVP and to present that to a VC Yeah, of course or if not? you can, yeah. Um, but, but it's you know, not going to be accurate. Yeah, I very often invested like well before that. I very often invested when someone has got has built a model that's based on a completely different data set, but has said, "Here's how I think I'd get the million images that I need," and I've looked at that plan and gone, "All right, I'm going to show up to that meeting with you and get that million images with you, and I'm going to draft that contract for you, and then if we do that work together, me as the investor and you as the founder, if we work on that together for a year." 
then we're going to be able to sign another contract and then we're going to be able to sell our equity for, for more. So it's, it's, it's sort of simple. Like I often uh, describe my job as um, essentially arbitraging prediction thresholds, um, which is a whole bunch of jargon. But the point is if I can figure out how you get from X to Y accuracy, I can also figure out how you get from X to Y gross margin and I can also figure out how you get from X to Y valuation as a company um, because your valuation is often a function of your profit margin, your gross margin or whatever else. And your gross margin, profit margin function of you know, how much you've automated something um, or how well you've predicted something, how much you've automated something to reduce costs or how much you've predicted something to increase revenue. Anyway, a little bit abstract. I'm prone to be a bit abstract, but sure, if you can build an MVP, amazing, great. But often if you work with an investor that's technical and practical, um, sort of unnecessary, I don't know, in this domain at least. That's what I've found investing in over 50 of these AI first companies. Hi, mine's maybe a little bit simpler, but you have such a passion for this. What do you think drew you to being so interested in AI? Is it the ability to be right more often? Is it the ability to you know, make better predictions for your investments? Like, what do you think drew oh, you to this? Uh, okay, so um, theoretically, it's just a massive lever. Just allows us to do less boring stuff. Um, there's so much boring stuff that we do, and AI can just do it all for us, and then we can just, like, sit around and have lunch and paint pictures and stuff. Um, so, <laughs> and the, play music. The efficiency of it, that it creates yeah, a more efficient, efficiency. Yeah, uh, efficiency for efficiency's sake is it something I sort of rail against a little bit, but it's... Um, you know, if we can develop other forms of intelligence that help us, then we can use our form of intelligence to its fullest, to be creative, to do fun stuff, to interact well with each other and whatever else. So that's like theoretically what drew me to it. Practically what drew me to it is I worked with massive travel companies on big data sets at a company I started and it was a mess. And, um, you know, I saw that we could only do so much with the techniques we had, which were not... Um, use utilizing intelligent systems, not utilizing machine learning and whatnot. And we had to do more with machine learning to really solve their problems. Um, so I saw that in one of the first companies I started. Yes. Oh, uh, there's one more. Yeah. Pierluigi, please. And I'm going to hang around. My flight's not till midnight. I, I don't have anything interesting to say about what you, you said, but I have an objection. No, myself and my nine-year-old uh, grandson, we take our Tesla, we go around, we let it drive, he plays with all the buttons. It's so cool. I don't know if that's AI, but technology yeah. can be extremely uh, interesting and uh, uh, satisfying. Yeah. So there is also that other uh, metric uh, yeah. to judge products. Yeah, totally. Firstly, it wouldn't be an Italian dinner without an argument. Um, <laughs> at least not in my house. Um, but yeah, it is cool. And, you know, I pick on that example because I think the end goal is not a realistic one or a productive one to aim towards or whatever else in some ways. There are other more discrete goals that are. Like, for example making a car that's really nice to use and tells you things when you need to know them, like what the speed limit is now because it's identified it on a sign using a computer vision system. Or something more discreet, like again, like driving my nunny around the retirement village, like that would be really useful because then Nunnal doesn't drive his car too fast and hit things um, <laughs> because he still thinks he's a really fast driver. Um, so like that, those discrete goals I think are just more productive. Um, those there's sort of bigger goals, like they serve a function, you know, you can recruit people, you can attract capital and whatever else to work on a lot of other discrete goals. I just, I just think it's a, you know, I was playing off a popular example that's given of AI, which is like self-driving cars. And I just think our, real, our expectations of achieving that goal are, are worth tempering, um, if only to reframe our perspective on what we can work on right now that will really help us, that's all. Um, but yeah, a lot of this AI that we're working on is cool and entertaining as well. Like this generative art that people are making with these, um, speaking of argument, these things, generative, generative adversarial networks, some people are familiar, but essentially think of like two AIs arguing with each other 
and then creating a new thing, a new argument, and think of that as a visual thing. And that people are creating some incredible art with this that like, in my mind, I'm not a very aesthetic person, I'm more of a musician than an artist, but is really beautiful and actually like more beautiful than a lot of other visual art that I see produced today. So um, yeah, it, and like if we use it for that, that's fine too. Well, we want an argument out of this. So all the million points that we have, data points that we have out of uh, Zviek events, I think predicts that are in the machine learning that is time for dessert. Yeah, right. It also predicts that uh, you like chiacchiere because this is the time in uh, Italy of uh, chiacchiere. So uh, accurate prediction, yes. So uh, join me and thank both Ash and Massimo for... This ongoing conversation, thanks actually to bring it over all these books. I know you brought it uh, with your, uh, you know, big, big um, arms. So thanks, thanks again for that. Um, thank you, uh, everybody here, uh, to come and join uh, and, and help the uh, Zviek Foundation. We are a not-for-profit entity. So uh, we're a 5.1c3, so every contribution that you have is really to support this community that you see right here. So. Thank you again. We hope to see you again very soon. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks.